Hey everybody, this is Brandon. Um, you asked me your questions and I'm gonna do the best job I can to answer them. I'll start with the first question I got. It was from at Sir Jack Holloway. How do you maintain your voice on tour? In 2003, Bleeding Through went to Europe with a band called Sick of It All. We did it for seven weeks in the winter. Um, I was so stoked when I got there. The whole thing was just like, <clears throat> I'm going to <clears throat> get on that stage and just give it everything I had and just rip my voice up, just scream as hard as I can and really get in those people's faces. It was our first like tour to Europe, so I wanted to leave a lasting impression. What I didn't take into consideration was the amount of cigarette smoke that's in those venues. And by like the third show, I just was pushing so hard and just recklessly pushing that I lost my voice. Basically the next six weeks of the tour was me coming back from having like no voice at all. So it was a nightmare and finally by the end of the tour, I had a voice again. So I came home and I was just like, what do I got to do? to make sure that I keep a voice like while I'm on tour because I can't have that happen a lot. And um, a friend of mine recommended Melissa Cross who does this DVD called Zen of Screaming. We went to New York to record a record and while I was there I, I visited her and did a couple sessions with her there and then also took her warm up tapes with me. And I did that my whole career and I never had any problems. And I feel that if you're gonna scream into a microphone for a living, you should probably take it serious enough to get professional help um, to learn how to do it properly so you're not completely pushing and losing your voice every show. And I think that was what kept me going for, you know, the amount of time I was on stage. I mean, there's some years where I'd be gone, you know, nine months a year playing a show every night. So um, it kept me really good and yeah, it was cool. Um, so I recommend going and see somebody to maintain your voice on tour. Uh, next one, at Justin Medlin, what's your favorite cheat meal? Uh, well, donuts are my favorite, um, but somebody reminded me of like one of my all-time favorite cheat meals, and that's banana cream pie from Marie Callender's, because <laughs> I could eat like 20 of those things. This one's from at Eddie underscore Vegas. What's your favorite tour with Bleeding Through and favorite bands you've toured with? One of my favorite tours that we've done was touring with AFI when Sing the Sorrow came out for them. Um, it was a short tour, it was only two weeks, but all the shows were great and it was really cool to see our friends kind of take that big step. I mean, they've always been a popular band, but to see that sort of explosion, like when that record came out and they started playing like 4,000 cap rooms and it was just like mass hysteria when they were walking around and when they got on the stage, it was really cool and really ins inspiring to see that because that was a band that always did it their own way and eventually got to a point where people took rec like took notice of that and recognized them for doing something and and, and being themselves. Um, it was really inspiring for us to see and I think that tour really helped us really maintain doing it our own way and not really giving into, you know, management and record labels and everybody telling us their two cents is we just really wanted to do it ourselves. So that was a really memorable tour for us. Um, other than that, Touring with Slayer was a dream come true for me because they're one of my favorite bands. Um, but some of like the some of the smaller bands that we've toured with, well, not so small anymore. But between the Buried Demeanors, one of my favorite bands to tour with. We're just really good friends with them and get along with them great. Um, Every time I die is another one of those bands where we grew up with and um, still see them char hard charging. It's really cool to see. So um, those are some of my favorite bands to tour with. All right, this one's from at. M S A R R A D E T. Let me try it. Miss Aradet, at Miss Aradet. <laughs> have you thought about traveling and hosting boot camps, like in Miami? I have thought about traveling and doing boot camps. There's one that's in the works. I think that we're going to be doing a boot camp tour in Australia in December. We're going to kind of see how that goes, and then from there, sort of the pipe dream is to go and do one in the states, and it would, you know, take a couple weeks and just travel stateside and and uh, do boot camps. I think it'd be a really cool thing. This one's from at Richard underscore Kelly. I'm very tall and thin, about 6'5 and 168 pounds. In December, I weighed 149 pounds. However, squats are very hard for me to, to progress with, let alone squatting itself. It is very unbalancing for me. How can I help this? Well, congratulations on putting some weight on. 
because that's that's a pretty big jump. So um, squatting is is vital, especially for strength and gains. Um, I've had this problem before where I've had a taller client and it's, you know, no offense to being tall. I mean, I'm not trying to sit here and be like short guy trying to tell a, sh- a tall guy like, oh, I'm sorry that I'm going to totally diss you for a second. But sometimes tall people have a kind of a baby giraffe effect where they're a little bit unbalanced, um, especially for squats. A lot of people, that's not the case, but some people that didn't grow up playing sports and kind of didn't really learn to play, learn to squat and stuff like that at a younger age, jumping into it's kind of a hard thing to do. Um, but my advice for you is to try box squats at first. Um, do things like structural balance that will help loosen up your hips and, and, and get your glutes firing. So things like box step ups, like single leg box step ups will help, you know, strengthen your hips, um, work your balance. <clears throat> From then, go to a box and do box squats. And so it's basically the same as like putting a bar on your back, except when you're squatting, you're sitting down onto the box, coming up off of the box. It really helps that that starting strength, and it also helps um, get out of the hole with like with power. So when you go deep into a squat, you get kind of stuck into that hole, and some people get stuck and they can't come out of it because you know hip tension and they just their glutes aren't firing and they just don't have the strength. But this will kind of help you get to that level and drive up from there and it'll also help maintain your balance and help with your hips as far as getting your hips to rotate out when you squat so for tall people um, for anybody really that's having problems squatting um, box squatting is probably the best thing to do I think this one is from at answer it's Melissa what's the best way to recover from muscle soreness any tips besides stretching and foam rolling I find that getting a good branch chain amino acid is good for muscle soreness. Um, if you're not kind of replenishing with branch chains in your body, your, your muscles are going to kind of take a beating and not recover as much. Also just recovery in general, just making sure that what you're eating is helping your body recover. You're eating things at the right time of the day. Um, not going too long after you work out to actually put nutrients in your body. But I find that a really good branch chain, um, will help you sort of recover from that. A couple good brands, the Muscle Farm uh, branch chain pill is really good. Amino One's really good as well for rehydration. That also helps with muscle soreness. Um, and a, ba- a brand called Extend, which is, I've been using Extend for, for years and it's fucking awesome. It's, I, I've had clients get on Extend before and they've told me that, you know, offset muscle soreness has kind of gone away a little bit. So it's just a really good product. So. If you have the extra dollars and, and you could you could purchase that that product or any three of those products, I I recommend it highly. This one's from at Wyatt X Power. I'm vegetarian. I'm having problems putting on mass anywhere but my midsection. Any suggestions? It's tricky with vegetarians because there's vegetarians that you know take a step further and they're vegan and they don't eat dairy or anything like that. Um, but just the amount of protein that you're putting in your body as a vegetarian. You know, there's arguments for and arguments against, and I'm gonna kind of try to stay in the middle as much as I can. But here's the thing. A lot of vegetarian proteins like soy, like if you're taking a soy protein, it's very wasteful. Um, Not that absorbable in your body, but there are really good, are really good um, kind of alternatives to that. And that's hemp protein and that's pea pod protein as well. Hemp protein's really good as far as absorbability. It has a really good rate of, of absorption. It stays in your body. It's faster acting than soy. Um, so I'd say the best thing to do is find a, like a really good plant-based protein, um, like a hemp protein, a pea pod protein, and, and take that and just take a lot of it. You're probably gonna run through one of those canisters every two weeks. Um, because the, the natural food that you, you know, if you look through like a raw diet or any sort of vegetarian diet, it tells you that you get enough protein from green leafy vegetables and nuts and legumes and some veg like some things like mushrooms and shit like that. But to be honest, it's not enough protein to put mass on. It might be enough protein to sustain a, a healthy lifestyle and get you through your day. But if you're exerting yourself in the gym and really pushing it, you need that protein in your body. So you're going to have to, I guess, synthetically put that, that 
protein in your body and that's why like maybe like a good hemp protein or pea pod protein will really help um the only downside of that is that shit is fucking expensive and it's going to be a really pricey venture for you to do that but there isn't any sort of natural proteins that's going to take place of that um and smoking weed is not protein so take hemp protein don't smoke weed I've, I've only saying that because I've gotten this, I've gotten an email before about smoking weed, how the person took hemp protein, but he found that smoking weed on top of that really helped release it through his system. And it was, it made me laugh, but it was absolutely fucking ridiculous. Uh, this is from, uh, at NG underscore O seven. When was the last time you drank a beer? What beer was it? Do you have a favorite beer? And if so, wait, if so, what beer would you drink and alcohol? Hmm. Well, the last time I had a beer, I was 13 years old. I'm 33 now, so almost a complete 20 years ago. Um, I think the last alcohol I drank was Old English. I don't remember like what my favorite beer is because it's so long. I don't remember actually really liking beer. Um, I've just never really had the desire to kind of drink over the last 20 years. Uh, I don't really know. No, what's a what's a badass beer? Like fucking <laughs> Coors Light or something. What's a manly beer? I would drink Coors or Coors because that's the manly beer. This one's from O Video. How do you ba balance having a successful music career or running your own gym? I'm a vocalist in a hardcore band in Fontana and getting certified to be a, a fitness trainer. And my goal is to do exactly what you're doing. Well. I was one of the ones in the band that wasn't naive thinking that screaming into a microphone was going to get me this career that was going to last me for the rest of my life. Um, I knew that we were doing something great and we had a great run and we had a really loyal, loyal fan base, but I started educating myself in fitness in about 2005 when I was home from tour. I started working out with a trainer, interning under a trainer, and when I was home from tour, I would be helping him out at the gym. So while the rest of my band was sleeping in until three o'clock, I was up at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., going to the gym, educating myself. And I remember the first day I walked into that gym and I, I walked through the doors and it was a small boutique gym and it was a few pro hockey players, the singer of Lincoln Park and a couple other people. And I said to myself, I'm like, this is what I'm gonna do. This is how I'm going to trend this is how I'm going to transcend from music to fitness and sort of create this type of atmosphere. And, uh, I guess it's just all about what you're passionate about. I feel if you're passionate about something, you just have to go for it and sacrifice is a big issue and you have to be willing to sacrifice things. I've sacrificed things for music and I think I've sacrificed even more to open my gym and, and work into the fitness industry. Um, I guess it's just the only way you can really go about it is it takes time, it takes effort, it takes work. A lot of people think this is easy. A lot of people think that you can make a post on Instagram and people are just gonna start following you and start wanting to, to train with you and it's not easy. This is a 24-7 thing. Um, you know, this is waking up at three in the morning having an idea and, and writing it, or writing an email at like four in the morning and or getting up at five in the morning and writing a program before you go to work. It's nonstop steps to take that, um, take that journey into this and be successful. Um, <clears throat> I've lucked out having like a, a, a really good following and a really good support system, but it definitely takes a lot of work. So that's all my advice for that can be. This one is from at lean and fit. Um, tips on bulking, high calorie, high volume, high volume food having trouble putting my, getting my numbers high. Bulking is just that, it's bulking. And a lot of people think that when you bulk, you could maintain, you know, your 6% body fat and, and which you, which it's a slower process. But if you're looking for something that's gonna be quick, bulking's gonna take a really high amount of protein, um, more fats than you're used to and a high amount of carbs. And it's all about kind of eating those things at the right time as well. Um, so the volume of your food is going to be pretty high and it's going to take, you have to kind of build a tolerance to get to that level to eat that much. It starts with breakfast and breakfast is going to be, you know, it's going to be a cup of oatmeal and, and six eggs and something else fatty and, you know, 
it's gonna it's to get through it it's gonna take a little bit so bulking i think that the key for if i'm ever like trying to put on size i multiply my fats by like three and basically throw out the window clean eating and try to keep it the pr at least the only thing i try to do is try to keep my protein to a certain point as long as i hit the protein for that day everything else that i eat is kind of just a wash it's just going in my body to help me gain weight so um i mean i'm not blowing it out with like pizza every night and ice cream every night but it's eating you know eating your fats like putting cheese on things eating some starchy carbs um eating pasta stuff like that and you'll find that you'll bulk out pretty quick a lot of people have like hit me up and asked me how to bulk out eating clean it's just you could do it it's just going to take a while it's not your quick you know couple month turnaround it's a six month process if you want to stay really lean and bulk out um yeah but that's my that's my advice you kind of got to eat like an asshole a little bit allow yourself mentally to get past yeah, I'm going to eat like shit right now and I'm probably going to feel like shit, but tomorrow in the gym, I'll feel better. You know, it's one of those things. Okay. This one is from at Stoella 27. What's your favorite movie and why? My favorite movie is Rocky. Um, why? It's very, if you watch the movie Rocky, it's very raw. Like the acting's not that great, but it's like, it's honest. It's like, the best thing I could say, it's like if it, what I could parallel it to is a band that is making music that out of their garage and recording it with like an eight track. It's not going to sound that good, but if the product's really good, you, you, there's sort of like an honesty to it and a truth to it. I feel that that movie is very, it's very true. It's very just getting to the point where the movie's trying to get to the point where I feel a lot of movies now try to be too cute with everything and it kind of ruins it. So. I think with Rocky, it's just very, it's gritty, it's honest, um, it's emotional. You could tell that the actors in the movie, when they were acting and, and the things that they were saying, like they actually got behind that and they were actually feeling it. Um, I don't know, when I see that movie, I just kind of just leaves that sort of feeling in me that's like it's very inspiring, which is the reason why it did so well and it's had such like a a big part of sort of our pop culture, but it really is a cool movie. This one is from the man behind, behind the camera at Shorty Sedang. If you had a chance to create a custom donut, what would you put on it? Well, I'm trying to take combine like my two favorite donuts right now. Right now, sidecar donut, coconut cream, and a maple bacon donut. And I think combining those two would be pretty rad. So something that was like coconut cream and bacon and maple and just for shits and giggles, I'd add like some cookies and cream to it. And yeah, so it'd be a coconut cream, cookies and cream, bacon, maple, cinnamon bun, <laughs> cinnamon roll. Um, or actually that would probably be better on like a apple fritter. So if you take all those things and put it on an apple fritter, that'd be fucking epic so yeah that'd probably be my my uh my donut of choice we gotta work on that i wonder if if i went to a donut place and asked them to make that to me they'd make it for me they'd make it so maybe we'll have to work on that this one is from at rebel without a pause thoughts on wraps belts and straps all the time or save them when for heavy loads it's just preference i think i use wrist wraps whenever i do anything that's requires pushing because my, my wrists are kind of weak. Um, even like stuff like bicep curls and I'll, I'll use wrist wraps for. Um, belts, there, I'm just, I've never gotten comfortable with belts, but I'll put it on when I try to do my max. Um, and straps, it's just preference. I mean, some people like the feel of straps when they're doing something like deadlifts or like bent over rows or any sort of rowing motion. Um, but some people don't. so there's benefits to all of it. If you're using straps because it allows you to lift more weight, you know, then do it. There's certain people that say, oh, well, it fucks your grip up and maybe, but if you're using it for purely to get more weight up, then, then use it. So that's my view on that. So anyway, 
Thank you for your questions. Sorry I didn't get to all of them. There was quite a bit of them and they're all really good. Um, I'll be doing this next week again. So I'll make a post and yeah, keep the questions good. I mean, they're really good questions in there. Um, a lot of stuff that had to do with the band and, and fitness and overall lifestyle questions. It's pretty awesome. So thank you for support and I'll talk to you later.